Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Rosalie from USV. A very warm welcome to all the panelists and the delegates in this talk show, The Green Studio. Going green refers to all the aspects of environmentally friendly products. Sustainable practices can help us strengthen community bonds, improve the quality of life, and provide hope for a better future. As we all know, Sulfonylureas are the class of medications that has stood the test of time in the management of diabetes mellitus. Despite the emergence of multiple newer drugs, SUs continue to play a significant role in treating this chronic condition. So, let us explore the reason behind the evergreen status. Also, I would like to keep you informed that being a responsible leader in diabetes care, USV has set up a state-of-art manufacturing facility for glycomet GP. This facility is built upon the principles of sustainability such as paperless manufacturing, tree plantation, rainwater harvesting, solar energy usage, zero liquid wastage, and others. With this breakthrough industry 4.0, we are taking a step towards a greener planet. With this, I would like to invite our eminent course mentor for today, Dr. Pia Balani. Dr. Pia Balani, ma'am, she's a diplomat of American Board of Endocrinology diabetes and metabolism. She's working as a consultant endocrinologist at Bombay Hospital, Rich Candy Hospital, and Dr. Balani's clinic, Kolaba. She's a founder member and honorary secretary of the BCO Society India. She's also very active in research and has multiple artic articles and book chapters to her credit. She has received numerous awards, naming just a few, Best Doctors Awards by Mumbai Outlook Magazine, Top Doctors Award again at Mumbai 2022 and 2023 by India Today and many others. It's great to have Dr. Pia with us today. And with this, I hand over the session to Dr. Pia. Yeah, over to you, ma'am. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to all our delegates attending our Green Studio meeting today. Oshley, thank you for introducing me. It is indeed an honor to be associated with USV, especially when we have pharma companies who are doing their own little bit in contributing to a greener planet today. I think that that's a big step forward. And I feel that everybody in pharma needs to contribute because that, of course, is you know responsible to lead the way. Our Indian companies leading the way is going to really carve a path for the future. Today, it is my, indeed my humble pleasure because I'm surrounded by the presidents and the vice presidents of all the endocrine societies, the diabetes societies that, that exist around us today. So really, it is, it is my, my pleasure to be associated with all of our expert panel. I have the honor of introducing, firstly, our first panelist for the evening. Uh, if we could have Dr. Sambit Das. Everybody put your hands together for the vice president-elect of the, the, of the Endocrine Society of India. It is a huge achievement, a representation of all of the endocrinologists across the country. So Dr. Sambit Das, what an intense pleasure to have you this evening with us when you've gotten this fantastic news. Thank Dr. Sambit so Das, absolutely, here, here. <laughs> so I think with Dr. Sambit Das, he needs no introduction. The fact that he's been elected today is representation enough about the belief that our community has in this inspiring endocrinologist who's had awards given to his name, as you see the last line, inspiring endocrinologist of 2019, Times Health Icon 2016. He's been part of every single society that there is to be a part of and currently practicing at, at the Kim's Medical College and Super Specialty Hospital at Bhubaneswar. So Dr. Sambit Das, again, a warm, warm welcome to you this evening. Indeed, a pleasure. Our second panelist for this evening Dr. Ganpati Bandwal, another past president of the Endocrine Society of India in 2021, and also the current vice president of the Karnataka Endocrine Society. Presently, he is the professor and head of endo at St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. So highly published, so many awards, the Nada Gorda Oration Award, the 2014 RSSDI Oration Award, the Sunil Kumar Basu Oration Award. Dr. Bandwal is omnipresent, as we all know. So Dr. Bandwal, again, such a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Thank you. And our third panelist for the evening from Indoor, we have Dr. Subodh Bansal. He is professor and head of Department of Endocrinology at SAMC and PGI Indoor. He is again represented on every single society. Such a popular teacher. You hear about him through so many students 
um, you know, fan following. He has been the president of Diabetes India, past president of API Indoor, the president of the of the API in, uh, of the Diabetes, uh, sorry, President Endocrine Society of India, MP chapter, again, omnipresent, represented through the decades in so many different societies. Dr. Banzal, again, warm welcome to you also this evening. Dr. Yeah, thank you. And moving forward then after this uh, introduction, let's get to the crux of the seminar of the webinar for tonight. And today, our first question that we are posing, um, there's enough of talking, let's get our panelists now and get their opinions on board. So our first question for the evening, well, to all expert panels, let's move on with the PPT, please, so that our audience can see this. So today, like we all know, I mean, we're on the eve of World Heart Day. Like everybody is aware, September 29th is celebrated every single year. This year's World Heart Day campaign, the theme is Use Heart, No Heart. And this campaign is actually focusing on the essential steps of knowing one's own heart first. And this can be done through, you know, can be focused through various scenarios. Today, what we're talking about is through environment, health, uh, uh, you know, taking care of priority risk factors. So Dr. Das, to you, my first question, what role can we play as doctors, as endocrinologists, as citizens? How can we promote a healthier planet, a healthier heart on this special day through initiatives like tree plantation or anything else you'd like to mention for us? Yeah, uh, a very good evening, one and all. And uh, at the outset, I must uh, thank the team USB for uh, giving this opportunity and the Wonderful introduction by Dr. Pia. I'm really thankful to you. And uh, I must congratulate you uh, and congratulate the USB team, especially for doing their bit for that uh, healthier environment and the green world and what initiative they have taken. Uh, so, so for, for example, doing this type of symposium where a green and healthier world is the main theme, actually. So uh, coming to the first question, what you have asked is how we are actually helping the environment and the health of the people by doing tree plantation. Uh, if you, For a tree plantation is definitely good. And if we tell about the healthier environment, then if I ask my 10-year-old daughter, then she can tell actually 20 good things about the environment, how tree plantation can help. But what, as endocrinologists, we are more interested is that what good we can do to our patients and to the society as a whole or to the human being with uh, tree plantation. Uh, uh, since we are endocrinologists, we are more concerned about the metabolic health, the heart health. And uh, if we tell the uh, tree plantation how it helps, probably it might be physical effect and also it has got some mental component to that. So for example, physical, so if, if you have tree plantation, if you have gardens, if you have parks, then probably you, you are more tempted to go for walk and how the both the ADA or ESC, SEC all recommended that how you should uh, go about the aerobic exercises and all and how they are good for the heart. And uh, second thing is that if you are planting a tree, then definitely it it also gives you a good exercise. You, uh, you are doing some kind of exercise in plantation. So that's about the physical thing, what I can extract from your question. And second is the mental health. And uh, I think all the societies have actually endorsed that mental health is also very important for the uh, physical and the metabolic health. And uh, definitely planting a tree, walking in a park or walking in the green environment, it reduces stress, it reduces the cortisol, it reduces different uh, type of bad hormones, and that will actually improve our health. So uh, this much I could uh, tell about the advantages of tree plantation for the health of an individual. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Das. You know, I would, I mean, I'm asking the panelists, this as an open question, if any of the societies or even USV for that matter, as a pharma company with a lot of reach, I think I would be happy to participate, but I don't know how to go, how, go ahead and executing this kind of thing. If people have ideas around on the panel or USV for that matter, I think that would be an excellent way for us to do our little bit on that front too as well. Dr. Bantwal, what is your opinion about this? And more specifically, the question to you today is about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Well, as we're all aware, these endocrine disruptors they are basically endogen, you know, exogenous agents that are disrupting our endogenous hormones and responsible, which are responsible for homeostasis, for reproduction, for developmental processes. What, in your opinion, 
uh, is the role more specifically in terms of glucose intolerance? Yeah, as you rightly told, uh, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, they are now considered as a serious and uh, urgent threats to public health, uh, uh, public health leading to a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually can affect the body by various ways. It seems there are more than 500 or 600 endocrine uh, disruptors are their chemicals. Predominantly affect the thyroid and the reproductive system. But yes, there are a lot others which can also affect, which can produce obesity, diabetes also. Now, for example, you have this uh, organotine substance. Uh, one is uh, tributylene. This can actually produce weight gain and via the PPAR gamma, via that. And the if you go into the molecular mechanism, it probably involves reprogramming of this mesenchymal stem cells towards adipocyte uh, lineage. Yeah, then uh, you can also have these problems if you're exposed prenatally also, say for example, to DDT. It can lead to future weight gain, especially in the children. So they found uh, this also. And then uh, they also found uh, another potent dioxin, what is known as a TCDD, which is an in insecticide containing malathion and diazinon. This influences insulin secretion, affects the beta cell, partly by downregulation via the muscarinic receptors. And then you have what is known as a diethyl hexyl phthalate. It is supposed to induce hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and reduce beta cell number. Uh, so that's uh, one of the ways. And then they also found that exposure to phthalates in adulthood might be associated with uh, gestational diabetes, IgT, obesity, and the, uh, these are supposedly obesogens also. Uh, once again, I told you prenatal exposure, not only to DDT, DDE also is in, especially in humans. Some association with uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes also has been found. That the, the probability of causation is around up to 40%, they say. So these are the various ways by which these endocrine disrupting chemicals can actually produce obesity and diabetes also. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ban Bantwal. Dr. Banzal, so what can we do? I mean, all these things are there around in our environment. Um, where are they? What can we do to decrease exposure in our daily routine? I mean, is there any way to avoid it or do we have no choice in our daily lives in terms of exposure? Very difficult question, Dr. Pia. As rightly said by Dr. Gan you know, Ganpati, you know, they are everywhere. Only for them, they become in the water, in soil, in food, in pesticides, in phenol, in all your cosmetics, in your hair dyes, uh, everywhere. You know, food material is also contaminated with all these phenols and, you know, phthalates and others. The DDT was the first one which was detected to have uh, such type of effects and DDT is bent. But how many you can bend? So important thing is what can be done? It is the government who should bring some regulations. Problem is, so far we are not sure whether they are how effective or how damaging they are for the human being. Because we have some studies done in animals where they have been extrapolated, but we know that they start from the womb, from the, the you know, fetus. And if the fetus is underweight, premature, uh, and uh, they become obese later on, they are more prone to get obesity and diabetes and whatnot. Infertility, the, the semen, you know, uh, quality, the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone, like this, and with all receptors we are working, they start from the receptor, the biosynthesis, the transportation, their reaction, their metabolism, everywhere these disruptors are there. So they are really disrupting our lives. The question is, what to do? So we started this green swan theory. And uh, look, that John Elphiston, he brought in this theory. He said, you have a solution which is there for everything. So I think we need to find some solution. The important things, avoid pesticides, avoid using plastics, avoid using too much of cosmetics and you know whatever God has given as a natural leaf, we should live. So problem is, I always say that in Indore I am here, we have uh, engulfed almost 40 villages around. 
to villagers are no more villagers. They have become richer than us because all the you know property value has gone up, and all right. of them have big motorcycles, book bellow, bellow, and uh, so they are putting on more weight. And we are not having the the ox and the bullet carts. Now they are having big you know tractors and other things. So the question is, what to do? So we have to go back to the original the natural lifestyle. We have to grow more trees, go for more plantation. Eat green vegetables, fruits which are not contaminated. So again, go for the organic and the real organic, not the artificial organic. That somebody charging more and giving you in the name of organic. So that has to be certainly avoided. And we should have our own. I have the garden on my top of the terrace. I am using my you know old things, and I think they are things and really tasty. Because what is important is try to avoid these artificial things, uh, the uh, contaminants. That is the best thing, and the plastic should be avoided. That is the biggest culprit. It seems to me. Over to Europe, Pia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. Difficult question to answer, but I think we have to find out. And government should help us, and they have to give some alternative to these people that don't use it. You. This that way, so he may not be that old. Concept has gone now. The thinner is. Certainly, you are much healthier than people are. So, what do you, Dr. Pia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bankar. And maybe, Dr. Das, you're getting some ideas on day one of this, of your vice president elect nature to probably this endocrine disruptors and, you know, maybe this green initiative, maybe something that the endocrine society can take forward with the government as Dr. Banzal is suggesting. And excellent. I think Dr. Sambed, as well as Dr. Ganpati, the old president or the past president, they should come out with something more in the endocrine society at our meeting. So I agree and with then you. Of Europe, course, yeah. we, have, uh, we have USV as the best support also as well. So there it's all Absolutely. ready made here for I think us. One, one initiative we can do is that in all conferences and meetings, rather than giving mementos, we can actually give some seeds or some small plants so that at least they can be planted every year. Right. Really. I mean, uh, I'm telling you, I, I do not lie about this, but the, when I get that little plant, the happiness that that gives me as compared to those other kind of things, it it's really, I mean, you've really hit the nail on the head, at least from my perspective. So yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, well, moving on then, question two, now we're going back to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sambit, is right now in terms of the ICMR data, 136 million people living with pre-diabetes 101 million people with diagnosed diabetes. The burden is only growing. Do you feel that as time goes on, the modern SUs with this ever burgeoning, you know, numbers of diabetics over here, are we finding that the S modern SU is going to have a role, especially in the current era of newer oral anti-diabetes agents? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pia, for that question. I think uh, you have rightly told that the burden is quite huge. And what does that imply, especially countries like India, is that the not only the burden is high, but uh, uh, the that will lead to poor uncontrolled hyperglycemia more and the poor follow-up will also be there. Because as per the data, and uh, all of us are aware about the 50% rule, like more than 50% are undiagnosed, even if they are diagnosed, 50% are treated. And whoever is treated among this 50%, 50% do not achieve or less than 30% at all, they achieve a target of uh, less than 7%. So definitely the burden of uncontrolled hyperglycemia is going to increase. And uh, we have to find a solution like something, some drug like which is accessible, affordable and acceptable. So these three things are very, very important for a drug which should be given to the patient. So almost like a 70% of the chunk or maybe 80% of the chunk who live in the rural areas where the acceptability, affordability, and availability is a uh, chunk. And also those 40% who, who have access to all the good medicine, there also I think the evergreen molecule like sulfonuria is going to stay because that is good for reduction of the blood glucose, very potent. And if correctly used, it won't produce hypoglycemia. And the major concern of weight gain will also be not be there if we are using the 
modern sulfonylurea like glimepiride and uh, glycolazide. So just I wanted to give one example by uh, from an article like Dr. Rakesh has recently published in one article where it's a real world data of uh, how we are using a sulfonylurea in our clinical practice. And the most common use is probably a glimepiride metformin combination in that to one milligram with 500 milligram. And uh, it has been shown in the clinical practice that almost all age groups starting from 19 or 20 to more than 80 years, people were also using that without much uh, problem like hypoglycemia and weight gun. I think the evergreen molecule is going to stay and with the ever increasing burden of diabetes, this is, this is a major solution to that. Right. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Samit, you're right that, you know, the sulfonyl ureas do remain a core molecule for our care with our, you know, populations the way they are. Dr. Bantwal, in continuation with what Dr. Das has said, so the low cost modern day generic sulfonyl ureas in comparison with the more expensive drugs, what do you think the pros and cons are between this in terms of patients as well as healthcare systems, in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, so regarding the pros, I would say that we have been using this from times immemorial, Absolutely. Uh, this medication. So we have a lot of experience with uh, using this. Secondly, HbA1c lowering potency is very good, 1.5 to 2 percent or even more when we start with the higher uh, A1c. Thirdly, see, we don't get a lot of obese diabetics. In India, we have the thin fat, uh, I mean, thin fat Indians, uh, where we are more uh, abdominal fat, but they are lean. They have uh, lesser insulin reserve, we can say. In these type of patients, actually, this will help. The, the sulfonylureas will help. And then the other question we used to, which used to people ask was about CV safety. What about CV safety? Now, we have a lot of trials, the Carolina trial, head-to-head -head comparison between glimepiride and uh, linagliptin. So, where they found that, yes, it's CV neutral. So, that's one. Advanced trial where they use glycolazide. Once again, they found microvascular benefits and also maybe a little bit of macrovascular benefits also. And then what do you use after metformin? There was a trial known as a Tosca IT. One arm used sulfonylureas and another arm used spiglitazone. Once again, CV neutral in that uh, so the newer generations are CV neutral, so that's very good. And then uh, recently there was an article on glimepiride associated with uh, where they found that in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic heart failure, they found that this was actually helpful. Higher the dose, the better it was. Fewer hospitalization, reduced CV mortality in this type of uh, uh, patients. Uh, so we are getting now a lot of data telling that you could use this in longer type of patient. Of course, even in CKD also, we can use uh, this type of drugs, of course, with reduced uh, dosing also. So a lot of uh, this one. Now coming to the cons. Yes, if you give a higher dose hypoglycemia, that's the reason we should start with maybe smaller doses, say one milligram, 0.5 mg. You also know that when you use this one mg or two mg, see, you get 80% of the effect with 50% of dosage. Doubling the dosage will only produce unpredictable hypoglycemias. So that's the reason. Start with smaller dose. The next question was about weight gain. Uh, the, the disadvantage. Uh, what I would say is you lose, you gain the weight what you have lost. So that's the thing. Maybe an additional one or two kgs you may get if you used it at a higher dosage. But otherwise, the weight what you have lost because of the glucotoxicity, uh, I mean, the osmotic diuresis and those things, you get it. And then finally, a theoretical risk of beta cell exhaustion. But then uh, that's because of the natural history of diabetes. So these are the three cons we can say, but otherwise very useful now with so much evidences against it. Fair enough. Thank you, Dr. Bantwal. You've beautifully In listed favor out... favor of it rather than against it. Okay. Correct. I think you beautifully listed out very, very clearly the pros versus the cons. Dr. Banzal, in your opinion, from the point of view of, you know, nowadays with the guidelines talking about cardioprotective efforts of the effects of the newer OADs, where do you think the modern sulfonylurea aligns in the treatment of individuals with, you know, cardiac disease and type 2 diabetes? And what about where the newer agents fit in into all of this also as well again? That's right. said by Dr. Now, uh, I think 
think uh, that's very important. The cardiovascular safety. See, self never detected in 1942. They right. came in market in 1956, madam. And I have been using, I use Restylone. I have used uh, diabetes, your papa might chatting and writing, you know, 100 milligram BD and the people were doing well. And we had all boots. Insulin was there, people were putting on weight and metformin, they're music from Hopkins, you know, just sitting in KM. So that, and then came the, uh, the glyase, that glipizide. Then came the down and or glyvanclamide and people will use, uh, see, I have used up to 30 milligrams of, of the glipizide and 20 milligrams of glyvanclamide for operation. From the time these newer OIDs have come, I started feeling why I'm writing 2.5 or 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams. So that is there. But suddenly, all said and done, it was UKPD, uh, this diabetes data group in 1970. They came out, they said that the may not be safe, the cardiac mortality was more, but it was never, you know, proven. The later on, in 2008, we got this advance. Advance was done with glycolagite, and it showed that it is cardiac safe, and suddenly it protects the microvascular complications, as Dr. Ganpati was talking about. And uh, luckily, or uh, unluckily for sulfonuria, and un unluckily for gliptins, that Carolina came in. And Carolina showed that, uh, that this is as good as glyphosate, is as good or as bad as the gliptin. Uh, the so they are cardio safe, they are cardio neutral. And recently, this uh, the European Society of Cardiology they published their data and they said that. It is cardioprotective. The all cause mortality is low, the heart failure rate is low, the, the, the MI is the admission is low, and the long term use is also safe as far as newer sulfonuria that will preside and glipopide are concerned. So they are quite quite safe. And see, without see, everybody talks about it. Maybe it is a pharma driven. So as see the green, green swan. Solution for everything. So we have solution from 0.5 milligram to 8 milligram or 6 milligram, whatever you say. You use it. Depends on what we are using. If you use too much of those rightly said by our past president, then you have end up in problems. Patient they have eating and they want to protect hypoglycemia or padega. So that thing is there. So as far as cardiovascular safety is concerned, the efficacy is concerned. They are quite good. I am quite happy using both glitazide as well as gripride. That is quite good. And without that, not a single prescription. Either we start them early or at the uh, five or ten years after the, you know, before the insulin is there, we are using sulfurvia. So that is what I did. So my take on, yes, go ahead. But use it judiciously. Use with lower doses. Go slow. Go low. Because you can't cure the diabetes. So your patient has to stay with you. And diabetes will stay with the patient. So go slow, go low, and go on. That's what I feel. Over to it, Opia. Thank so, you. Dr. Bansal, then, do you start very often with the 0.5 milligrams also? What is your usual progression in dosing for glimepiride, let's say? Yeah. Usual depends on what the patient is. It will elderly, CKD, 0.5. FT, I know sugar is, you know, 10 milligram percent is A1C. 250 is fasting. I start go 1 milligram, sometimes 2 milligram also. So I go low, but nowadays we have this SGL2 inhibitors, we have DP4 inhibitors in combination with one, 1 milligram with metformin or either of them. That's what I'm doing. Right. I remember when I was in fellowship, Dr. Manzal, we used to give 8 milligrams of glimepiride. I mean, that <laughs> was like standard. It was maximum dose glimepiride, maximum dose of the glitazone, you know, 45 mg and mm -hmm. metformin. So those were what we had at that point of time before all of these newer OADs came in. And we were using it very happy, happily and comfortably as well. <laughs> so, comfortable. I've been using it for so many years now. Right. And you have probably seen so many. Nobody died that, or whosoever died, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Dr. Sambit Das, uh, to you now, basically, in terms of when patients are sitting with high glucose levels, how do you decide about a treatment plan, insulin versus SUs, insulin and SUs? How do you, what is your treatment plan in this kind of scenario? Thank you, ma'am. So I think the first uh, question you asked is what we should place uh, either a sulfonuria or a 
uh, insulin. I think the insulin initiation or when we start insulin has been quite clear cut. If any acute uh, condition, acute metabolic decompensation, predominant osmotic symptoms or the patient is quite thin or the HbA1c is more than 9%, fasting is more than 250 or random is more than 300. So there are clear cut guidelines where we should uh, use insulin. So, uh, but if the patient uh, in a, uh, is not having osmotic symptoms, the glucose levels are high, maybe 1.5% above the target limit, or even we can initiate as the second line therapy with metformin and sulfonylurea if the HbA1c at the beginning is more than 7.5. So I think a sulfonylurea or the, uh, especially the modern sulfonylurea uh, should be a good choice. I just wanted to highlight the recommendation from uh, the Safe and Smart's uh, modern sulfonylurea recommendation and also the Indian RSSDA recommendation where they where they placed sulfonylurea both at the second line and also the third line whenever the HbA1c is more than 1.5% above the target or it's more than 7.5% even at the beginning. Now coming to the second part of your uh, talk that's quite controversial, the question is whether we should combine an insulin with a sulfonylurea. So uh, there are many controversies to that, but one clear-cut non-controversial part is the BUTS therapy, that is the basal insulin-assisted uh, uh, sulfonylurea therapy that, that all of us commonly give where where we give an sulfonylurea with a metformin and then we can initiate with a basal insulin. And with basal insulin, uh, sulfonylurea can be given. There is no controversy to that. The controversy arises when we start with a prandial insulin. So whenever a prandial insulin is added, ideally we should reduce the sulfonylurea and we can plan for a, uh, stopping the drug also. Again, I wanted to highlight the recommendation of Indian RSSDA and also the other recommendation is that even with premix insulin, we can give sulfonylurea, uh, there are advantages to that, there are disadvantages to that. Suppose we are giving once a day a premix insulin and we are starting, then we may add a sulfonylurea with the other uh, major meal. Or even if we are giving two uh, doses of premix insulin, we can add a short acting sulfonylurea with the lunch time. So there are data to support that and uh, there are good data in fact. And their proposition or their advantages, what they have told is that probably reduces the uh, insulin dose by around 20 to 30 percent and also it reduces the pricks. But there are some problems with that because it may induce hypoglycemia also and weight gain also. So we have to basically balance the situation. But uh, giving with sulfonylurea with basal insulin is a very clear cut thing. And if you are giving a premix insulin, you have to be, you can give by reducing the dose of premix insulin. One has to be careful. So, Dr. Das, I want to know about your personal practice. How often mm -hmm. might, so I know guidelines are part in your personal practice. So number one, my question to you is that are you also giving sometimes patients needing high dose of insulin? If they are on basal insulin plus brandil, whether as a premix or whether as a basal bolus, do you sometimes also for patients with very high requirements, you know, add on? I found that even when I've added on multiple other OADs, requirements of insulin or more than 100 units a day very often, a little bit of sulfonylurea might sometimes help to, you know, get things a little better. What is your personal take? Yeah, my personal take is that if the person, obviously basal insulin, I continue with sulfonylurea, but if I'm add, adding a prandial insulin, then uh, sometimes adding a small doses of sulfonylurea actually reduces the doses of uh, insulin and also the frequency of the pricks. So probably basal plus can also be, uh, very nicely given with a, another shot of insulin rather than going for a full-blown four pricks of basal bolus therapy. So as you rightly told, to reduce the dose of insulin and sometimes to reduce the pricks, we we do this type of maneuver also. We give a sort of small doses of sulfonylurea. Right. Uh, Dr. Banzal, in your personal practice, let's say patients come in with hyperglycemia. Do you Are you very strict if they have a little bit of osmotic symptoms and they say, please, no insulin, new patient coming to you, first time, gluco, you know, little glucotoxic. Do you sometimes give in and say, chalo, I'll give one sulfonylurea instead of giving insulin when the sugar is like 250, 300? As per guidelines, you know you need to give insulin. How lenient are you or how strict are you in your personal practice? Dr. Banzal, I'm asking you this. Or oh, Dr. Bantwal. Dr. Bantwal, Dr. Banzal, both of you. Okay. I want to hear about your personal practices. You can call him Dr. Banpati, otherwise both of us get okay. confused. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Dr. Ganpati is 
please. Okay, I I, I uh, use it very often. In fact, because many of my time, many of the time, the patients don't agree. Only thing is, if he's having severe osmotic symptoms, ten kg yeah. weight loss and all, only then actually I will uh, uh, see that they are put on insulin. Otherwise, I give them uh, a sulfonylurea and they become better right. immediately. Correct. No, I totally agree. I know this is probably not as per the guidelines which all our societies are written, but it's true. We have to adapt to the patient's requirements. Dr. Banzal, are you using these hacks also I as well? Think, I, do you stick to the I think this is your always advice. See, see, I know that 10 units, 12 minutes, and sometimes they don't take these, we give them sulfuria, come down, and insulin is returned, and patient sugar has come down to 130 and 180. I see this is why insulin is working. Sir, I this is how they fool you. So at least indirectly you know that these work, whether they are working short term or they will need it long term, that remains a question. But certainly glucotoxicity also comes out with sulfuria, but it is better to start go with guidelines so vessel insulin with sulfuria I'm using. And sometimes yes. even with the basal bonus, there are patients who are, because the moment you stop, especially the metformin, sulfuria, the sugar, they go up and they need very high doses. That that's the time you need. So I think they have some some role to play. That's what I my personal experience is. Absolutely. So patients are there and you are there. You can also, you know, certainly that's what I feel. Correct. No, so that's why I want a balance between what the guidelines say and what we all are doing in day-to-day -day practice. Could be a little different, but now it's good to we, we, are, we, to... We, are, we are in a position to write guidelines, all of us. So, let's see. Right. Okay, moving on then. So, we've understood insulin and sulfonylurea practice in all our personal clinics. Dr. Bantwal, over to you now. Basically, in patients, this population of CKD, what are the benefits, the considerations, of modern day uh, SUs in CKD management. And also, please give me your take about mm -hmm. dialysis patients, ESRD patients, also, uh, your, where you feel SUs fit in. Uh, yeah, now coming to patients with CKD, uh, I normally use short acting sulfonylureas like a glipizide or a glycolazide. Uh, you can use glimperad, but then you have to be very cautious. It's a little bit long acting, that's why. If at all you're using, start with 0.5 or 1 milligrams and then gradually uptight it because of the long acting. But glipizide, glycolzide, good enough. Uh, of course, in fact, we see the KDGO guidelines which says you can use glycolzide without dose modification, but common sense tells you shouldn't do that. Start yes. You start with the lower dose and then gradually uptight it only with, if the blood glucose is high. Uh, the uh, advantage being uh, it does not act on the EPAC2, so there is no excess hyperinsulinemia which can happen. Uh, so that's the advantage when you use uh, glycolizide. Uh, yes, so glimipiride, cautious, but you can use it one milligram like that, 0.5 or one milligram you can use. Uh, this is the advantage compared with the long acting like glibenclamide. Yes, never use it because the uh, uh, the metabolites also have hypoglycemic potency. They can produce severe hypoglycemia, refractory hypoglycemia types. Yeah, and if you you if you're using a hypoglycemia in CKD patients, I mean if you're using a gl uh, glibenclamide in hypo uh, in CKD, you will have to keep the patient for at least twenty four to forty eight hours if he develops hypoglycemia. Minimum forty eight hours, I would say. Otherwise, what happens, he goes, once again, he goes in for hypoglycemia. So that's another thing which you will have to keep in mind when you're using medications like uh, glibenclamide. Short-acting ones, glycolazide, glipizide, and maybe even glimipiride with caution because it's a little bit long-acting. So that one. In dialysis, I prefer to use actually insulin only rather than uh, sulfonylurea in these type of patients. So short-acting in, uh, insulins. And maybe an intermediate acting insulin or a long acting, depending on how his blood glucose is. Uh, I usually prefer the insulin because insulin. when you're on a dialysis, your creatinine is around six, seven, eight, nine, and all. No, right. so that's right. the reason. Right, uh, Dr. Banzal, Dr. Das, would y'all for dialysis patients, or let's say even for the renal transplant group of patients, any any opinions about what would be your best choices, Dr. Banzal? 
insulin the best the best if as the the kidney failure advances they go to esrd many of them they don't need any medication yes so what to talk about gluconeogenesis is not there insulin is getting delayed or getting not metabolized so those things are there so many of them if needed as rightly said by dr pati i use the stop taking analog and they work well and sometimes when we have tablet of xr or mr you know dimicron or whatever glegless ideas so i do said accidentally so so this is what my practice is so over to dr samit you have anything to add yes sir absolutely so in patients on dialysis i think insulin is the best option when the sugars are high maybe uh, short acting or ultra short acting when the sugars are not that high and it it, it is around 180 or 200 so maybe a dp for inhibitor like linagliptin and all i usually prefer but sulfonylurea definitely on uh, at the time of dialysis or during dialysis or during that period we don't give right and what about transplant patients any opinions you would still insulin being the only choice do you all consider any oads for that kind of patient maybe other than a gliptin linagliptin varieties in post transplantation they are on immunosuppression they are on steroids so they mean we need a higher doses oh they are they are there but i think insulin along with that because once that kidney has failed they have the transplant they are worried they are worried so we want everything to go on smoothly insulin yeah. along with oh can be used not a problem if creatinine is normal one can use even metformin but we are not a problem ट Yeah, so what I say is I agree with Doctor Subodh Banzal. Same thing. Only thing is when you are having a fluctuating creatinine, the creatinine is not stable. Then don't use the metformin. Otherwise, you can actually use even metformin because once you are transplanted, it becomes stable. I think you could use those drugs. Not an issue. Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. So we have a consensus there. And Doctor Banzal, to you. in terms of hypoglycemia you have seen the older generation su's like you mentioned right up to the modern day su's you have seen it all where well, from the resting on don vitamin to chlorpromide to everything i have seen it you think right but <laughs> as these generations have progressed dr banzal how has the risk of hypoglycemia changed and what is the current day risk of hypoglycemia compared to the older su's the patient always asks me See what is the side effect, sir? I always tell the only side effect is hypoglycemia. The only thing is you should know the same rice or same dal somebody is cooking makes good good you know food or good cooking and somebody is spoiled. Said so it depends on you and your patient. So that's the important. Go low, short acting sort of thing, and they do not get. you that much of hypoglycemia see what has happened in in uh, this uh, carolina i was talking to if you give 6 mg 4 mg somebody is going to have hypoglycemia then you say compare that very high, high you know uh, hypoglycemia rate so depends on what the sugars are how you counsel the patient including insulin all all medications they are prone to give hypoglycemia depends on what dose is what type of patients whether patient they have ckd patient they frail baba ji they at ts of age and why you want to give high doses those so those things are those hypoglycemia is there with all medications except you may say metformin sometimes they also come yes. some factor hi hoti hai wo jo hypoglycemia hota hai you may call it relative you know dp for inhibitor with sulfonylurea they are better ones ever being we call them both dipizide as well as dimipride use in due dcs you know doses and somebody takes up two hours pehle goli khai khana khana bhul gaya then what is the problem with them give price you know so those things are there counseling is very very important doses of medications are important comorbidities are important and the patient is admitted in in icu why you want to give 
You know, so those things are there. Otherwise, they are quite safe and, and we are using them. That's what uh, my take on this. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sambit, how would you counsel your patients when you're starting a hypoglycemia? I think that's a good thing for our audience to understand what is the counseling going in for recognition and management of hypoglycemia. I keep telling my patients, don't waste your time calling me at that time. So, you know, otherwise they're wasting those five, 10 minutes trying to get in touch with you. So how do you counsel your patients at that point? Giving a phone number, I agree, is very important. The patients feel well supported when you're giving insulin or things like that. But otherwise, your routine counseling for SU use. I think uh, that that also holds good for patients using insulin also. So really a person who is on insulin or on sulfonylurea, we counsel for uh, hypoglycemia. And uh, uh, in, in our folders also, there is there, there is a clear cut instruction how what, what is hypoglycemia and how it should be managed. Like they should not be calling in panic at uh, 2 a.m. at night uh, about what to do and uh, but then they complain later on that you didn't pick up at the time of emergency. So I tell them that uh, the management only one emergency can happen and that is hypoglycemia, not the hyperglycemia. So hypoglycemia, you should know yourself, you should know the symptoms and you should know how to manage that. So if we counsel them, then uh, they don't land up in hypoglycemia. And if we counsel them that if you are taking sulfonylurea, there are chances of hypoglycemia. If you are missing your food, in uh, if you are vomiting or if you are in uh, any sickness, if you, if you are taking the full doses of sulfonylurea, then you may land up in hypoglycemia. So only those few counseling if you are doing, then we are definitely avoiding uh, any major episodes of uh, hypoglycemia. Right. Uh, Dr. Ganpati, these patients frequently start eating all their cakes and ice creams at that time. What do you tell them about how to, what are the specific instructions you might tell them regarding correcting that in a short, in, in, in two sentences, please? Uh, well, I tell them use glucose. That's some, or you can use juices. Yes. Don't take, uh, what is this, creams, cakes and all, because they contain fat. Right. And as you know, fat will take some time for absorption. So that's the reason... Uh, I always tell them these things should be kept with you, including yes. this um, uh, chocolates. Uh, I mean, the Cadbury's don't take it. It'll take some time. Yes. So you have to take only this. Right. Absolutely. So I think that's an important message that I think once we teach patients how to recognize it and manage it, a lot of those panic given, you know, driven uh, responses that occur will get managed. And I think that is one thing that I think all of us doctors, managing patients with diabetes, I think one of the questions that the patient needs to be asked every time they come up is whether they've had any such symptoms. So at least if they don't know how to recognize them, you might revise with them, you might revise with them how to deal with it. I think that the more patients are aware about all of this, the lesser they are going to you know, panic themselves and also kind of call us and it prevents us those 2 a.m. calls, like Dr. Sambit was saying. Hey, Dr. Go Dr. ahead, Dr. Dr. The rule of 15. Yes, See, absolutely. This is what is important. They should have, if they have some symptoms, if they can measure sugar, it's fine. Cannot measure, correct themselves with 50 gram, 15 gram of glucose or equivalent, maybe half a cup of juice or, you know, two biscuits, they sort of thing and they can eat. And after 15 minutes, not getting corrected, repeated. After 15 minutes, still they are okay. And if needed, cheaper hypoglycemia, they can take extra meal also. But right. don't take it too much, otherwise the sugar they go to 250 and 300 and they inject again and it goes on like that. Sometimes right. reactive hyperglycemia is also there on a shooting. So from Ganpati's, you know, Dr. Ganpati's uh, stay, I remember in Austin days, before people taking the pegs, they used to have butter and so they will have long, you know, sort of <laughs> effect of that thing. So we come. So all these fat things, they hinder the absorption. So don't take with chocolates or other things. That's what I feel. Thank you, Dr. Gatpati. Right. You reminded me the olden days theories. <laughs> okay. well, that, was a, that was a good analogy over there. Uh, yeah. Well, our last, our last segment over here is a small case-based discussion. So let me talk about over here, a 64-year-old female come to your clinic with type 2 diabetes over the last three years. Do we want to put up this slide? Can we share this slide for all our audience to see also if that's possible? In the meantime, I'll tell you about the history. So she's 64, diabetes, three years, dyslipidemia, currently on metformins as well as, um, yeah, we can go to the, okay. Well, on metformin alongside with SGLD2 inhibitors, she is, along with her lifestyle modification, she's not been very good with her follow-up. 
Now her labs are, we are going to look at over here. The next uh, slide, please. Fasting PP 132 to 28. A1C is high at 9.1. You're looking at her cholesterol values also. LDL 124 with a TG of 242. Her blood pressure 140, 90. Pretty borderline there. And a GFR of 75. My question to you is, in the context of this patient's case, would you consider modern SUs? And how do you think they would fit into this patient's treatment strategies? Uh, Dr. Ganpati, let me start with you. What do you think you would do next? Uh, yeah, so what I will do is, uh, in this patient, probably I'll start with a small dose of uh, glimepirate in addition to whatever existing. Yes. Maybe I may begin yes. with uh, 0.5 milligram twice a day. Uh, I don't know what is his weight. That's the reason. If it's very lean, I may even begin with one milligram twice daily because okay. his HbA okay. is 9.2. Right. Uh, right. If I give uh, two milligram, yes, around 1.5 to 2 percent decrease can happen. But I think for in the safer side, better start with 0.5 milligram twice daily. And if you see the glucose levels also, predominantly postprandial is high. So if you're using a glimepiride, it can lose predominantly postprandial than fasting. So you don't expect a hypoglycemia to happen also. So I will start that. And then the triglycerides are high because the glucose is high. You control the glucose, then the triglycerides also will become uh, normal. Of yes. course, the LDL will not come down so much. Yes. So maybe we may even have to add a statin to this patient. So right. I think, yeah, I'll be adding a smaller dose. Right. Uh, Dr. Sambit, your opinion. I also want to know from you, Dr. Sambit, how much do you feel the modern day sulfonylureas will really increase weight? Do you feel there is a significant contribution there? And again, with this patient's case, uh, let uh, you know, what are your opinions? Yeah, uh, coming to the first question, like uh, regarding the weight, uh, we have good evidences that the modern sulfonylurea, especially the modern sulfonylurea, I'm not talking about the older one like uh, glibenclamide and all, the chances of weight gain is not that much. And in fact, one of the studies where they've actually compared with DP4 inhibitor and there was just a mild in increase in the weight. And what Ganapati sir has uh, told that the sulfonylurea actually regains the weight what you have lost, maybe because of uh, severe hyperglycemia. And maybe a little bit more. So weight gain is there, but it is not a major concern with the modern sulfonylurea, especially the glimepiride and glycolyzide. Uh, regarding the case, I completely agree with uh, what uh, Ganapati sir has told that we should start because the patient is already on metformin and SGLD2 inhibitor. Still, the HbA1c is 9%. No other uh, third line of drug, say DP4 inhibitor or uh, uh, maybe a GLP-1, it don't reduce the uh, HbA1c to that much other than the sulfonylurea. So maybe we can start with a lower dose, uh, 0 0.5 or 1 milligram, or maybe once in a day, and then we can actually uh, tighten the dose and control the blood. Glucose. Go up over there. Fair enough. I think totally agreed. Dr. Banzal, what is your opinion? Do you think that sulfonylureas, I mean, we talk about this beta cell exhaustion. Do you think sulfonylureas continue to give um, sustained control and what is your opinion with regard to the durability and finally with the management of this patient? See, sustainability is a question because as you see the natural history of diabetes, we do not have any basic pill which can preserve the beta cells. So by the time the sugars are up or diabetes is diagnosed, almost 50% of the beta cells have gone. So what do you have? They have talked about the data zones, you know, DP4 inhibitors and others. We are not very, very sure whether they really work. So with time, things they change and you have to increase the doses. Second thing, lifestyle is very, very important. Yes. What patient is eating? See, the, see, I have seen patients coming to bariatric surgery with sugars or high or A1C 11 and Keep them on liquid diet for three days and you see everything tumbles down. So that thing is also there. It means what so I always tell them, yeah, that's what I you know tell them. So that, that is there. And in this particular patient, if you see his fasting is 136, PP is 224, A1C 9.2. So I always tell 9.2, it is is Purani Pap Dikatai. So it last two months, three months, what has happened is showing. But now patient is control or better control. If you see these figures, the A1C should be around 7, 7.5, not 9.2.
So if you really want to bring down to 2, so I will not talk about A1C of 9.2, I will see fasting and PP. As rightly said by both of my you know, friends, Dr. Sambit and Dr. Ganpati, that PP is high. So I may use only a carbose or alpha glucoside inhibitor, or I may add GP4 inhibitor that may control. See, we are talking here the evergreen give price, so we have to say that I will be using 0.5 or 1 milligram. So we have other options also to go. So uh, this is what I feel. So A1C is gives you the the past of at least two months, may not be three months. And the recent blood sugars are su suggesting that patient is now disciplined. He's using his you know, uh, lifestyle, and this is also you need just correction of those PP and fasting. Bring it down a little bit, A1C will come down next visit or so. That's what I, I take on this. Triglyceride have to be certainly, again, the diet has to be controlled. Over to you, Dr. Pia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bandal. I think we pretty much have a consensus from all our uh, all our colleagues over here, pretty much saying that the SUs still have a good standing in modern day diabetes management, superior efficacy, capable of bringing down A1C, not like many other diabetes agents that we have available. We use this when patients are glucotoxic to bring our sugars down in the place of insulin, which is our most powerful molecule today. We're using SUs in place of that for that matter. So very a molecule with great efficacy over the years with so much experience, like we're hearing from Dr. Banzal over the years, safe overall. CKD-wise, cardio-wise, weight-wise, all of that put together. These drugs are symbiotic, work, you know, with all the other molecules, small doses, even with insulin also as well. So we have superior efficacy, we have safety, we have symbiosis, and finally, we have a drug that is Sasta. And that is, I think, what is very, very important for our population, for our economics, for our healthcare systems that we have. We need something that is applicable one and all. So with that, I'm going to take away two lines from everybody. Dr. Banzal, starting with you, your last two words of conclusion for SUs and their place in today's Okay, SUs are still there. But I forgot to mention, Dr. Priya, is that I have used a DVI TD or so. That is fair for minimum, not a use it. Oh, my. So that is there. So, then, so we have used all sorts of things, and they are still there, and we are working. So it will, it will remain for the next maybe two decades or till I practice. That's what I feel. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's going to be a long run, Dr. Banzal. <laughs> yes, that's off to you. Uh, Dr. Das, your final words about SUs. Uh, let's hear from you. I think uh, SU is uh, is a truly evergreen molecule in, uh, Absolutely. in our uh, diabetes treatment, and it is going to stay forever. Right, Dr. Ban uh, Dr. Ganpati, your last closing words from you, please, for the day. Uh, well, I will agree with all the speakers. Actually, yes, there is a role for ACUs and it will continue to stay. Uh, what has happened is with these new guidelines, yeah, the number from one, maybe it has come down to two. Many instances are there where we actually even start writing it as the number one drug, especially when you have a blood glucose, which is very high, A1C more than, say, 8.59%. We tend to it from the beginning also. So, yeah, so the usage came down, but then it's not the number of prescriptions. It's coming a little bit down, but still we have a lot of places where we can write it as number one, like the example what I gave. So it will continue to stay. That's because that's a natural history of diabetes. It's right. progressive. So you can't control anything with one drug itself. The other drug has to be written off. And then now that we have evidences for the CD safety, et cetera, we shouldn't be hesitant in starting it. Use a proper dose. That's more important. Don't start with a very high dose. So start with a smaller dose and then gradually up right? rate. There's not necessary to bring down the blood glucose immediately. You can actually bring it down slowly also. So that's, that's great. first award I have Right. I think that's I think the the sulfonyl urea, ureas are there to rescue us from any kind of high diabetes, whether as drug number one or two or three or four. We know that we are all using them at the end of the day before going on to insulin, it's going to wear, come somewhere in our prescription. So start low, go slow, avoid those hypos, but we know that these drugs are there, have been there for the longest time and are going to be there for time to come also as well. Oshali, back to you then. Uh, we're at the close from our end. Thank you, thank you to the panelists from my side. Thank you to all the delegates who attended. Oshali, please back to you. Thank you, Dr. Samway, Dr. Ganpati and Dr. Pia. We should clap for ourselves and for Dr. Pia. 
thank you very much. It was very nice. Thank you very thank much. You. As always, well. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. PMM. It was an amazing session and really short of words to express my gratitude. I would just like to start by thanking Dr. Pia Balani, ma'am, for being so amiable and amazing as always. Thank you for giving your valuable time to us. Thank you, our expert panels, Dr. Banzal, sir, Dr. Sambadasa, Dr. Ganupati, sir, for sharing, you know, for being so explicit and sharing your knowledge time and was done with us. Thank you for making us spin down all those pragmatic approaches. Dear delegates, thank you for joining us. We had around 1600 plus logins and and last but not the least, I would like to thank my team, uh, Abhishek, uh, Shashikala, ma'am, and uh, Digimet team also, Pratik, uh, for the support. Without the support, this wouldn't have been possible. So thank you, everybody. Have a thank great you night. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you, Shashikala. Yes. Thank you, good night. Good night. Thank you, USB. Dr. Ramathya, Dr. Pia, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good